Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Prime Comments. Hope you're having a wonderful Sunday. Uh, and before we get into it, I want to make a small announcement about our Nintendo Prime podcast. Starting this week, we are going to have one long video for our podcast, and we are going to continue that through the end of of well this year and then we'll revisit if we want to continue that format in 2018 now this is how most podcasts handle it whether it's a video version or an audio version they typically uh just have one long segment and that's it well we've been splitting up our segments kind of following an old thing that kind of funny games used to do uh, where you split it up per topic and then we found that the per topic videos from our podcast were getting more views than just the one long video podcast. So we just decided that that was the best way to move forward. However, an issue happened this past week that made me rethink all of that. And that is that we had videos come out about Xenoblade Chronicles 2 and videos come out about Doom at times when what we talked about in those videos were no longer relevant. And this was always going to be an issue that was going to crop up someday because we typically record Thursday nights, release a day early on Sunday evenings, and then start releasing the podcast on Mondays. And because of that, we're already a few days behind as is, but because typically gaming news doesn't come out over the weekend, we're not really going to be too far behind on topics when it's published on a Monday. But since the Xenoblade and Doom 1 were two of the last topics. They came out after the Xenoblade Direct and then, you know, the same day that the Doom reviews were coming out. So, uh, to combat that, we are just going to go back to one long podcast. Don't know how I'm going to handle titles with it yet. We already have the new episode done. In fact, if you are a Patreon backer and you are at the $5 level or above, you can literally listen to the podcast right now. It was published before I even recorded this video. Uh, and if you want to hear this week's podcast already, go to patreon.com slash Nintendo Prime and check it out. Five bucks a month. You can access the podcast right now. This week, it's just Eric and Nate. Uh, and hopefully next week, we'll be getting some of our $20 backers on. So let's get into the comments from this week. There's only three specific comics we're going to go over out of like the 18 videos we released. Uh, yeah, man, I've, I've been really ramping up video production. I think we're, we're not too far away from me averaging 20 videos a week. That's almost three videos a day. That's insane. Uh, especially since it's mostly just me. But... Let's get right into the comments. Uh, so this first comment comes from the AAA publisher should take lessons from Nintendo to increase profits and lower risk. It's kind of a discussion video I made, giving my opinions on that. And Umer Asif had this to say, AAA games are becoming a fad. Just look at all the games released. They start with huge hype and anticipation. Once they are released, they start to lose their value within months. AAA studios can't afford to take risks and create a new, amazing idea which they think will give profit. So at core, they add little to no changes to the already tried and tested gameplay. Mechanics. Majority of games are just the same game mechanics, with each iteration getting a massive eye candy so it feels new and fresh. But when you play it, it starts to get boring within weeks. Western studios are working like mindless machines. All they want to do is recover the money they invested, taking low risk and maximizing profits. Nintendo is a completely different story. Their philosophy is gameplay first. Rest goes around the gameplay to complement it. Their story is almost the same for Zelda or Mario for years and years. But the gameplay is just so different, unique, and fun that no one cares. Graphics complement the world and they create it into play, so it's f still fun in 520p as much as it is on 1080p. Sorry, really weird sentence. I had a hard time reading that one. Uh, they take risk in new games and ideas in a very smart way. Look at ARMS. They launch a completely new IP, a new way to play a fighting game. To prevent losing a ton of money, they sort of made the game where it will suffice to be fun and show what can be done with minimum budget. Once it started to sell well, they started to add more into the game, improving the game from the profits. They did the same with Splatoon 2. Nintendo loved to take risks. After Wii U, no other company would have dared to take a risk in Switch, but they did rather than make the most powerful box out there, like everyone wanted them to. They took another huge leap of faith with the Switch. So I appreciate some of your sentiments. You're, you're wrong on, on some parts that you say about Nintendo. 
Um, as an example, the sales of ARMS have nothing to do with the content that they've added to ARMS since they announced they were going to add that content to the game before the game even released, and the sales of ARMS is less than impressive. Um, it's To give you an idea, 1-2 Switch has outsold ARMS. Uh, while it's sold over a million copies, I don't know if Nintendo considers that a success or a failure. It's certainly not at the levels of Splatoon when it originally launched. Uh, and the content that they add in Splatoon and Splatoon 2, again, all of that was announced they were going to do that before those games came out. So it's really got nothing to do with how well those games sold for that content. That was the original plan for those games before they even released and had even one sale. So, yeah, that's really got nothing to do with Nintendo's plan for those games. Um, sorry, a little itchy here. I don't know why I'm, I'm kind of itchy on my nose, but uh, yeah, outside of that, I don't know. I mean, here's the thing: like when you talk about triple AAA games are becoming a fad, they're obviously not a fad because triple A games have been around for decades and decades. Uh, fads are, are like the Wii, <laughs> um, not not something like triple A games. Triple A games aren't actually going anywhere. Triple A games today are arguably as popular as they've ever been. Um, they're only getting more and more relevant, not less relevant, if that's the case. Uh, that doesn't mean there aren't other types of games that are becoming extremely relevant. I think the B tier of gaming has started to come back, which was desperately needed, and I think uh, it sucked when that kind of went away, when AAA games really took over heading into the now HD era of gaming. But, you know, you talk about how... Uh, how uh, AAA studios can't afford to take risks. They can't afford to take risks. It's got nothing to do with affordability of taking a risk. Uh, Horizon Zero Dawn, hello. If you're going to give Breath of the Wild and Odyssey and ARMS and all this stuff credit, why not the new IP that Sony has in Horizon Zero Dawn, which took a lot of risks in terms of the type of game it is, being a single-player game in a market where multiplayer games, not having a ton of microtransactions, blah, blah, blah. They just released a really, what appears to be a really, really good uh, story-based DLC pack, um, and by and large, is fantastic. It's not just Nintendo doing these things. Uh, I think sometimes when uh, you are so invested in a single company, like a lot of people are with Nintendo or Sony or Microsoft or EA or Ubisoft, like people who just play like those kind of games or on those systems, you tend to forget that Nintendo's not the only one taking risks. Um, Ubisoft, uh, you know, the division, that was a risk. That was a new IP. Um, Ubisoft technically did a risk with Mario plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle. Um, I know it's a spinoff game from two like well-known series, but it was, still was a pretty big risk, especially for a strategy game that's like XCOM. Pretty big risk. Uh, there's other companies taking risks. Nintendo's not alone. Um, and the companies I just mentioned, like these are third-party companies. So, uh, and when you're, you know, you look at uh, how they add little to no changes. That's what a lot of people think Nintendo does. Um, does the upcoming Kirby and Yoshi game look really that much different from other Kirby and Yoshi games? Uh, did Mario Kart 8 really look that much different from Mario Kart 7 and Mario Kart 6 and Mario Kart 5, 4, 3, 2, 1? I mean, Nintendo does iterative things as well. Um, you know, Super Mario Galaxy, what is it being praised for? Feeling a heck of a lot like Super Mario 64 and Super Mario Sunshine. So is it that they reinvented the wheel or that they realized what people want out of 3D Marios and just gave us more of that? Um, same with Breath of the Wild. Did it reinvent the wheel by being open world when the original Zelda game was open world? Uh, or having more RPG elements when Zelda, through Zelda 2, used to literally be an RPG? I don't think, um, that Nintendo it reinvents the wheel as much as a lot of people think they do. I think what happens is they realize, uh, that they got pretty stagnant and that they were making a lot of iterative things. Uh, as an example... New Super Mario Brothers, New Super Mario Brothers 2, New Super Mario Brothers Wii, New Super Mario Brothers U. That really became iterative. It doesn't matter that New Super Mario Brothers U is probably the best game of that series. It just felt very samey going game to game. Same with Super Mario 3D Land, Super Mario 3D World. The games felt very samey, even if the latest version of it, 3D World, was, in my opinion, a vastly superior game to 3D Land. Uh... Yeah, it, Nintendo gets iterative, and then they realize they've been kind of doing that for too much, so then they go back to something they used to do. Um, I know Nintendo, we like to give Nintendo a lot of credit, but like, why are people excited for the next Metroid game? It's Metroid Prime 4, the fourth game in an ongoing uh, style of Metroid games. 
Um, Pokemon on Switch, we're just excited to have a console version of a Pokemon game. Um, and, and Pokemon itself has been very iterative over the years. So, yeah, Nintendo... Um, I don't know. That, Nintendo takes a lot of hardware risks. Uh, they take a lot of risks in terms of trying to create uh, a new way to game. But their bread and butter is very iterative stuff. That doesn't mean they don't put new ideas into that. Obviously, like item breaking mechanic and the cooking and all. And there's new stuff in climbing everything. That's probably the biggest thing they added in Breath of the Wild. Like there is new ideas they put in these things. But for the most part, um, Nintendo is just like all the other AAA companies. They're really, really good at what they do, and they stick to what they do. Uh, and they still make new IPs, as do other companies. Um, so, yeah, I guess I just don't agree with your entire premise. I think you're giving Nintendo too much credit, uh, and you're taking a lot of credit away from what AAA publishers are doing because uh, they're doing a lot of the same thing that Nintendo's doing. You know, when people get mad, oh, another Call of Duty, oh, another Assassin's Creed, oh, another Mario game, another Zelda game, another Kirby, another Yoshi. I mean, Nintendo does the same thing. Um, it's just you like those games versus maybe not liking their games, whereas there's people that like those games that may not like Nintendo games, hence a bunch of people yelling at each other, um, <laughs> throwing a bunch of mud at the wall and seeing what sticks for some reason. Um, you know, when you talk about, you know, massive eye candy, there's obviously games that go for the massive eye candy, but they're also good games on top. The Uncharted series, the Last of Us series, very, very good eye candy, but also just very, very good games. Um, but yeah, you know, you talk about like mindless machines. I guess we usually mean Call of Duty when they say that, but I don't know, Call of Duty's still fun. It's a fun thing to play. I, I don't really see an issue with, I guess, a more mindless game like that. Um, and in terms of uh, recover the money they invested by low risk and maximizing profits, AAA gaming is anything but low risk. Let's just be clear about that. Um, AAA gaming is all about spending that money, money, money. Uh, in fact, what makes a game AAA is the money spent on it. Um, so it's very high risk. Uh, in terms of maximizing profits, if they're a Western studio especially, they legally have to maximize profits. If they do not try to maximize profits, they can be sued by their shareholders. So, uh, Nintendo, I don't know what the laws are in Japan, so they might they might not uh, be able to be directly sued about it. Plus, Nintendo seems to buy back a lot of their shares, so Nintendo holds on to a lot of their own equity in their own company, uh, which might prevent, you know, that might be a preventative measure, measure from being like, oh, you're going to sue us, but, like, we're the majority shareholder, you can't sue us kind of thing. And I don't, I don't even think Nintendo is the majority shareholder in themselves, but... Yeah, I think they're trying to become the majority shareholder so that way they can't have uh, that the investors looming over them being like, hey, you have to do microtransactions. You have to do loot boxes. You have to do this. You have to do that because it makes the most money. And what Nintendo does right now obviously makes money as well. Um, but could they make more money in Super Mario Odyssey if they added microtransactions for the costumes? If they added loot boxes? Sure, they would make more money. But they're not doing that because they don't want to. Um, in the West, if it was made by EA, we could talk about EA, the evil corporation, but like, if they don't do that, they can be sued. So EA is stuck between a rock and a hard place. Like they want to make great games, but they have to throw in this stuff because if they don't, they're going to get sued because this stuff has been proven to maximize profits. They have to maximize. Like sometimes we forget that video games are a for profit business. Video games aren't a charity. They don't owe us anything. Their pure existence is about money, money, money. It's about making money. Anytime you think a game company cares about you, especially at the AAA level, you're wrong. They don't care about you. They care about money. Even indie developers, uh, when you when an indie developer lives, up, lives out their dream and makes their dream game and puts it out there, they're putting it out there hoping to make money. I mean, they might. it could be a, a passion project, but they're hoping their passion project makes them money. Then the creator of Minecraft is upset that he made all this money off of Minecraft? Of course he's not upset about it. Why would he be upset about it? I know he's, he's battled depression and some other things. It's a topic we're going to get into later. But yeah, um, too, you're taking too much credit away and giving too much credit to Nintendo. Anyways, we'll be done. Uh, the second comment we're going to talk about, Sony has zero plans to compete with Switch, a lack of potential in the handheld market, a little news piece we put up this week. Trevor Grover had this to say, I mean, Sony wants Nintendo in their own hybrid console market so that Sony doesn't have to compete with Nintendo in the traditional home console market space. I don't think that's true at all. I don't think Sony cares if Nintendo made a traditional home console or not. Um, I think what happened is 
Sony doesn't think they know how to properly connect with people who want games on the go, uh, which was very apparent with Vita and their approach with Vita. I mean, the Switch is basically a Vita, but with its full potential realized. Um, Sony, I think, realized that they just don't understand that market very well. Uh, so they're going to stick to what they know. They're going to stick to what they've always been best at in terms of video games. Um, and they don't really care if Nintendo owns that one market because Sony doesn't doesn't see any crossover with that market. Even though you can argue home console gaming on the go, you can say there's crossover there. Uh, we just got Doom, we're getting L.A. Noir, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, uh, Sony right now doesn't view that as competition, so it is what it is. We'll see what happens in the future. They have no reason to, by the way. Switch came out, is doing phenomenally well, topping sales charts. PlayStation 4 sales weren't hurt by Switch. Like, they didn't slow down because Switch came out. So... Uh, should they even be concerned? Of course. I mean, of course not at this point because Switch is doing better than Sony, but Sony sales aren't doing any worse. In fact, in some metrics, they've actually increased year over year. Anyways, yeah, that's the last comment from this week. It comes from 2018 will be the year of third party on Switch. I guarantee it. Again, a bold statement by me. Um, Christopher Kensey had this to say, or Kensey. And it's all thanks to Breath of the Wild. Link single-handedly saved Nintendo and the Switch. Link was the reason Ultra Street Fighter 2 sold 500,000 copies. Link was the reason Mario Plus Rabbids was massively profitable. Link is the reason Bethesda is giving us Doom. And Link is the reason every other success story on the Switch. Breath of the Wild was the catalyst to this runaway train of success. Everybody thank Link. You couldn't be more wrong. Link and Breath of the Wild were a catalyst for having a killer launch game for Switch. Uh, it certainly was the reason that a lot of people bought Switch at launch. But none of that matters if, one, Switch itself isn't appealing. If the Breath of the Wild was a launch game on Wii U, Wii U wouldn't have been successful. It still would have sold out at launch like it always did, and it still would have tanked after that. Uh, just because you're a launch title, a, a great launch title, doesn't guarantee anything. Let me give you an example. Super Mario 64, launch title. For the N64. It was the reason to buy an N64. Yet the N64 only moved a little over 30 million units. By today's standards, that's not good. I mean, that's even less than the Xbox One at this point. So, you're talking about how Zelda, is, or like Mario is why Ocarina of Time sold then? Mario is why, and you know, GoldenEye sold? Like, that's just not, not the case. In this case, the, the, the what it was was the combination of a killer launch game combined with hardware people want combined with consistent software releases. This was, there is not just a one factor that made the Switch successful. Just like there's not, you know, Breath of the Wild isn't why Ultra Street Fighter 2 sold 500,000 copies. Ultra Street Fighter 2 sold 500,000 copies because there was 500,000 plus people that owned a Switch that wanted to buy Ultra Street Fighter 2 despite the fact that it was more expensive than other versions of the game. Um, Mario plus Rabbids was massively profitable. We don't actually know if it was massively profitable. We assume it is. Uh, but Mario plus Rabbids was massively profitable A, because of Mario, B, because of Rabbids, and C, because it's a really damn good game. It didn't need Zelda to sell it. Uh, if they didn't have Zelda at launch, Mario Odyssey would have been there at launch. By all accounts, Mario Odyssey has been ready for over a year. They delayed it till towards the end of this year because Zelda uh, was ready too, and they obviously weren't going to keep delaying Zelda after all the delays that had. So they were going to have Zelda come out at launch and then have Mario Odyssey come out end of the year. Uh, so yeah, if Zelda wasn't there, Odyssey would have been there. And I argue Odyssey might have been a better launch game in terms of sales. So... Yeah, um, I don't think Zelda's why we're getting Doom. You could think Zelda's why we're getting Skyrim. I can see that, but Doom, I don't think it has anything to do with it. That has to do with Nintendo. Went to them in person, said, "Here's the Switch. We really want you on our hardware. Well, what can we do to make it work?" And that just worked out. Like we know that Nintendo went to them in person. Um, literally, their Japanese branch went to Bethesda in person to their studios and been like, "Hey, what do we got to do to get you on our platform?" Uh, they did this actually with several third-party companies. Bethesda is just the only one, um, and 2K, I guess, a bit, that, that kind of took the bait and said, all right, all right, we like what you're doing. We're going to give you this, this, and this, and we'll announce it when we're ready. Uh, so, yeah, you can say Breath of the Wild was the catalyst. Breath of the Wild was just part of the reason. Um, a very important part, but not it. Not, not everything. So I'm not going to thank Link for the Switch being successful. I'm going to thank Nintendo for having a good idea, marketing it right, hitting with the right crowd of people, uh, having a platform that actually works the way they say it'll work, 
And for maybe the first time in years, no game droughts. Like, and I'm not just talking about, oh, they released some indie games. I mean, like, good games consistently coming out over the course of the first year of the platform. We're not even to the end of the first year, and we already have Xenoblade Chronicles 2 coming out. We have this entire month as, like, all third-party games. Uh, I'm sure we're going to end up with uh, Yoshi, or I think it's Kirby, that's announced for early next year. Uh, so that's probably going to land in January or February. So they're consistently releasing good games. that uh, Good to great games at this point. So, yeah. Um, Zelda was, is a part of all that, but not the whole reason. Moving on. The final thing we're going to talk about quick is uh, I made a video this week. I just want to draw some attention to it. Breath of the Wild helps save someone's life. A personal story of escapism and depression. I didn't take any comments from that because a lot of personal stories in there, people bring it up. Um, I went per I, I, the first 13 minutes of that are basically me talking about the story about uh, how this person was depressed. I read off their, their story they gave. Um, and how Breath of the Wild uh, kind of helps save them and help, help get them out of the place with even quotes from actual uh, psychologists on there um, talking about how Breath of the Wild and Zelda could be a perfect way for people to escape. And then I transitioned that into 13 minutes talking about my life and my experiences with depression um, and how uh, I even mentioned an injury that it happened, the, happened that same day I recorded it. I'm actually still dealing with it. only reason I'm not wincing in pain is because I've been trying not to move my arm or my shoulder it's actually down into my back now too i didn't even realize that at the time um so i'm in i'm in a lot of pain i can't even sleep very well but i just want to draw some attention to it i'm gonna put a link down to that and, and the other uh videos we talked about in the comments below just if, if you have depression uh you know watch that video uh, and hopefully it'll help you um maybe realize some things about yourself uh maybe help you get some help i hope uh the hardest thing to do when you have depression is admit that you need help uh, just like with anything in life, anytime you're struggling, the hardest thing to admit is that, Hey, you, you need help. It's okay to admit that you need help. Um, all of us need help at times. Anyways, folks, I'm Nathaniel Ruffle Jens from the Tender Prime. And if you like this video, you know what to do. And if you dislike the video, hit that dislike button, subscribe for more content, and I will catch you guys. See, see what I mean? In the next one.